Royal Lane family, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest preacher to you today. He has been a dear friend and mentor to me, and I know he is known and loved by many here at Royal Lane. Doug Watts is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and a certified educator with the ACPE, the Standard for Spiritual Care and Education. He and his wife, Charlotte, share their life with their four children and five grandchildren. Doug has served as a pastor in Indiana, Ohio, and Texas, and as a children's minister here at Royal Lane. 
He most recently served as the Director of Spiritual Care and Education at Children's Medical Center in Dallas. He has been a professional pediatric chaplain for over 25 years as he nurtured and cared for hospitalized children and those who loved them. Doug also served on the Godly Play Foundation board for nine years and as president of the board for three years. His passion, evident by his life's work, is to nurture and guide the spirituality of children and advocating for the least of these, our children. Thank you for welcoming Doug with us today. On Trinity Sunday, we remember with solemnity and praise the foundation in which we live and worship throughout the year. We are invited to encounter God as three in one. The traditional language for the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For many, however, the traditional language is a hindrance to the intimacy of their relationship with God. They note in particular that the tradition incorporates only male language for God, and seek to incorporate other images which point to broader understandings of our triune God. Giver, gift, and Holy Spirit, maker, lover, keeper, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of all, are some other Trinitarian images drawn from powerful scriptural reflection. Our scriptures today remind us to remain confident in God's love and to be confident that for those who seek to live by the truth, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ.
If you would please join me for our call to worship, invocation, and hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Give the Lord glory and power. Adore the Lord, resplendent and holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Heed the voice of the Lord, full of power. Regard the voice of the Lord, full of splendor. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of God's glory. The glory of God thunders. The Lord's voice flashes flames of fire. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. In God's temple, the people cry glory, for the Lord will give strength to the people. The Lord will bless the people with peace. Let us pray. Holy Trinity, your word is a lamp unto our feet, yet there are great mysteries in life that we do not understand. We may ask with Nicodemus of old, how can these things be? Give us just enough light that we could step out in faith and do the next right thing. May it be so. Amen. Good morning, young disciples gather around. I have really been thinking about beginnings and endings and new beginnings and more endings. And that fits right into our scripture for today. When Jesus says, you must be reborn, you must find a beginning in the spirit. So this has been such a busy spring. And I don't know about you, but if you suffer from allergies, it has been the throat scratchingest, runny nosest, eyes itchingest spring I have ever had. And because I was so busy itching and scratching and sneezing, I didn't look around and really enjoy 
all the new things that were happening. And then we drove through Oklahoma and into Kansas this week. You would not believe every horse ranch had beautiful new foals right on the grounds with their skinny wobbly legs. Every herd of cattle that we passed had so many beautiful small calves just standing real close to their moms. When I got to Kansas, for the first time in a long time, I had a couple hours just to sit on the back porch. And I was reading my book. There were small bunnies in the backyard. And there were not fully grown squirrels, tag, playing tag all over the trees. And I thought, what a wise, what a wise God we have to give our earth a new beginning every spring. A whole season to remind us that we get to start over, that things will try, try, and try again when things don't work out, that after a period of wet rest in our winter, things will grow and they will sprout and they will blossom. And I went to a graduation this week and it felt the same. It was a time of new beginnings and endings. My nephew has made it through 12 years of school plus kindergarten and he's on his way to Oregon. And for his mama, I'll tell you, there was a little bit of sadness. He's moving far away and her house will be so much more quiet and there won't be brothers to fuss at each other. And yet he's going to do something he loves. Like our own Mr. Brian, he's going to study maps and he's going to be a creator of maps. And during COVID, he's already given himself the challenge of figuring out the GPS of almost every important place on the planet. So he'll go to this great state of Oregon, to this really cool college, and he'll study. It's exciting, right? But it's an ending and a beginning. And that's what life is like in our seasons on this planet, in our families, in our education. We're always stopping and starting. So I want you to pay attention because God needs you to know, I think, that you can always start again. Whenever you're feeling discouraged or whenever you're afraid that something's not working, know at a certain point we'll get to try again or we'll get to do over or we'll get to stop and start. When there's an ending that's making you sad, something's coming to a close that you really love, or a person you know might be moving or trying to do something else where they won't be with you so much, please know that's an ending and you should grieve it and that's good. That means to feel sad, but you also get a chance to try new things or make new friends or remember and know the person who's leaving in a different way. So God says, be reborn over and over and over. God has the power and the wisdom and is so much mystery that God can get to know us a hundred thousand new ways if God needs to in our lifetime. So friends, enjoy spring and the beginnings around us. Live through and enjoy the endings because they bring new beginnings and know God is with you through changes and mistakes and failures and tryings again and success and new things and adventures. God is always here. I love you and I miss you. And next week we'll be together. We start live worship again, friends. This is our exciting new beginning. Here comes June and our summer and here comes our time together. I can't wait peace until we're together again in the sanctuary. Holy, holy, holy God, in calling forth creation from the void, revealing yourself in human flesh, and pouring forth your wisdom to guide us, you manifest your concerns for your whole universe. You invite us as your people to gather the world's needs into our hearts and bring them before you. Today, we pray especially for those we name now, silently or aloud, a post in the comment section. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy God, fill us with strength and courage, with discernment and compassion, that we may be your instrument of justice and love in this world, that it may be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
The scripture this morning is John 3, verses 1 through 9. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God.
Well, thank you for your invitation to join you in worship today. I'm grateful to Royal Lane and to Harry and many of you watching today uh, for many reasons. One is because of the way that you loved Nathan and Whitney when we were members here, and also for the way you allowed me to love your children when you, we were children's ministers here. So I have feel very welcomed in this place and with you. Our passage today is one of the most familiar passages in all of the New Testament. It may even be one of the very first scriptures that you memorized as a child. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I think that was the second verse I taught my children. The first was, children, obey your parents. You are aware that John's gospel was written almost 100 years after Jesus' ministry. So in that 100 years, the stories of Jesus had been told probably by John and had even been written down by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's reasonable to assume that John had told these stories. It's also reasonable to assume that he had even read the stories from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it really begs the question, do we need these stories written down? Why would John, a hundred years later, write down more stories about Jesus? Clement of Alexandria, I believe, had the best answer for that. He wrote, John did not see the events of Jesus' life simply as events in time. Rather, he saw them as windows looking into eternity. And he pressed toward the spiritual meaning of the events in the words of Jesus' life in a way that the other three Gospels did not attempt. So John, rather than writing a historical account, wrote a spiritual account of the work and the words of Jesus. So come sit with me for a minute. Come join me. Come with me in this circle to hear the story. Warm from above, again, and again. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your eternal word. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations on each of our heart will be blessed by you in the speaking and in the hearing. Amen. Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Not only was Nicodemus a Pharisee, he was a leader of the Pharisees. Now we know at that time that Pharisees were a rather select group in Jerusalem. They were really what amounted to a brotherhood. And there was never at any time more than five or 6,000 Pharisees. And what they were known for was being obedient to all the laws of Scripture. Every one of them. The scribes created the laws. And the Pharisees dedicated their life to following the law to the letter. That was where they gave their life. To keeping all of the laws that the scribes had written, and believe me, it was more than the Ten Commandments. More than we could count almost. That's who Nicodemus was in part. But it's also true that each of us have a Nicodemus residing in us when we think about our relationship with God. That is that part of us that believes if we can just get the right law, if we can get the words just right, and then if we can follow those words to perfection, then we will have a complete understanding of God. 
As a matter of fact, you could find any number of people that would be doing just that in sermons all over our country today. Here's the rule, and here's how you follow that rule, and doing it will bring you to God. Now, I don't have a lot of qualms with that because it works really well until it doesn't. Because at some time or some place, someone is going to change one of the rules without you knowing it. Or somehow something's going to change about how you follow that rule. And I wonder if that's what was going on for Nicodemus that night. He was troubled. This leader of those who had committed themselves to following the letter of the law perfectly, was troubled, so troubled that he couldn't sleep. Something was keeping him up at night. And in one of those sleepless nights, he comes to Jesus. Now remember, Nicodemus coming at night, there's a lot of ways of understanding that, but John's writing to us about a spiritual gospel. So let's consider a moment what it means that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. I'm afraid that we spend so much time sun, sunbathing in the light of God for understanding that we often have no conscious awareness of experiencing God in the night or when it's dark. It seems to me that our knowing of God as light can blind our experiencing God in the darkness. But let me remind you about night and dark. Consider this. Remember, John's writing about spiritual things. Consider this about night. In the beginning, darkness covered the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God was moving. Hagar, being cast out by Sarah, went out into the wilderness with her infant child in distress and lay that child under a tree and went a distance away so she would not have to be near that child when the child died. And I believe that was a night time for her. Joseph was thrown into a well by his brothers and left for dead. And it was night. Jonah was in the belly of of a fish. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was visited by an angel with some word that was incomprehensible to her. And I believe she faced that as a time of night for herself. And then Jesus himself, this very Jesus whom Nicodemus was coming to at night, was in a tomb and in the darkness of that tomb. Night may very well be the closest you're ever going to come to an experience of God. We're more curious at night. We can't see things as well. Our imagination can carry us away at night. We are more mischievous at night. Some of us more of that than others. And we wonder about God who goes bump in the night. And isn't it curious that all these aspects of ourself and what it means to be human when we are in darkness or when it is night, to be curious, to have an active imagination, to wonder, to, mis to be mischievous, are not those also characteristics of God? A God who is curious, who wonders, who is playful, who uses imagination, and is even mischievous. So I wonder what night you are living in right now. I wonder what the darkness is that you find yourself surrounded by. I wonder what you're not seeing so clearly in your life. 
And I wonder if in your personal darkness, you are as close to experiencing God as you will ever be in your life. So Nicodemus, in his personal night, comes to Jesus with a proclamation. And it was probably that very proclamation that was troubling him, keeping him up at night, that he could not make sense of, he could not understand, much less follow completely in the way he lived his life. He says to Jesus, I know you are from God because I see what you do and no one, can do what you do unless the Spirit of God is upon them. So Jesus responds to Nicodemus with his own proclamation. Nicodemus, you can never even experience God unless you're born from above or born again. And I can imagine Nicodemus hearing that saying something like, you've got to be kidding me. be born again? I cannot understand that. I can't wrap my mind around that. And Jesus' response, this is only, can only happen by the Spirit, Nicodemus. It's not something that you can comprehend just in your mind and make sense of most of the time. It only comes from Spirit, from the Spirit. Now let me tell you about the Spirit, Jesus says. The Spirit's like the wind, and you have no idea where the wind has been. You see the effects of it. You hear the sound of it. You don't know where it's been, and you have no idea where it's going. That's like God. Oh, my God, Nicodemus might have said. I I cannot believe that. I can't understand it. And Jesus then says, good, because being born from above is not a perfect understanding. Being born from above doesn't doesn't mean you know every law and you follow every law to perfection. Rather, being born from above means you have an experience with God that you can never really explain, but you know it is true. And if we were to testify, wherever you are this morning watching that, you would testify to that in your life. There are times that you've had experiences of God in your life that you cannot explain to anyone or even help anyone else understand. You don't even understand. This experience of God as spirit comes from who knows where and we know not where it's going. It's a new birth, like being born from above again and again. We are changed. We don't know how, but we know it's true. And we know this new birth came while we were in the dark. So I wonder this morning, what is the proof of this experience? What is the proof of this change that somehow happens in our life? Jesus said the proof of change, the proof of experiencing God is love. We demonstrate the very love with which God loved us. And that love is a love that gives I should say to you that this change, this being born from above by the Spirit of God and an experience of God that often comes at night and come from who knows where and where else God is going, this change comes with a warning label. And the warning label is this. Just as Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to love us all the way to salvation, we are condemned not by God, but by our own lack of consciousness and refusal to demonstrate the love that we have experienced from God. The surest way 
to know your self-condemnation is how you project that condemnation onto others. Lord knows there's a lot of opportunity for that. The speck in the other's eye is the log in our own eye. Jesus said that love refuses to condemn others. Love has no part in condemning others. But rather, love lives us into a new way of being. You may never fully understand it, but you can experience a new way of living, a new way of seeing. You can experience being born from above again and again. Amen. the Lord of moon and sky. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I have made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright, who will bear my life.
finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it all? Thank you for joining us for the worship service this morning. Following this service, we invite all members to join us for a short, special called church Zoom conference to elect Jamie Luckett to the deacon board. Jamie was nominated to fill the unexpired term left by Amy Ward Meyer. We wish Amy Godspeed as she, Penelope and Nolan, join Ed in Washington, D.C. this summer. You can find the Zoom meeting link in your email inbox or in the YouTube chat. If you want to vote in person, there will be members of the tabulating committee at the church in front of the church office until 1 o'clock p.m. Thank you and have a wonderful Sunday. People of God, go forth in the world that God so loves, remembering that the love of God is stronger than your fear, remembering that you are a child of God, and that the triune God is with you now and always. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.